Dear Patriots, before the news starts, please, subscribe to our patriotic channel by clicking the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to this video. Don't forget to leave your opinion below in the comments section. Share the news on Facebook and Twitter so you friends see it. Thank you. Trump's legal team in flux as he reverses hiring decision. Donald Trump's legal team is back in limbo after the president reversed course and decided against hiring two controversial lawyers who had made unfounded claims about special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation and other Russia-related situations. In a statement released Sunday morning, Trump attorney Jay Sekulow cited conflicts of interest as the reason Joseph D. Genova and Victoria Tonsing, a married couple, would not be signing on. The two had been set to represent the president personally, not the White House, in the probe into Russian meddling in the 2016 election. We thank the president for his confidence in us and we look forward to working with him on other matters, De Genova and Tonsing said in a joint statement. The personnel turmoil comes as Trump's attorneys negotiate a potentially critical interview between the president and Mueller's investigators. It's unclear who is representing the president in those talks. While Trump last week signaled that he was willing to answer questions from Mueller, he'd been urged by John Dowd, his lead personal lawyer since last June, and outside advisors to avoid doing an interview because of the possibility he might commit perjury. The short-lived prospect of adding the husband and wife legal team caused waves from the start. De Genova's hire was announced Monday, and the pair visited the White House with Sekulow on Thursday night to meet with the president. It caught Trump's existing legal team by surprise. Dowd resigned over the move, even though the couple hadn't yet completed an ethics review needed to officially make them part of the team. A senior administration official said Trump's lawyers pleaded with the president against hiring D. Genova and Honsing, citing conflicts of interest and their ages, he's 73, she's 76, and saying that their penchant for extolling unfounded theories could put them at odds with Mueller's investigators. In January, D. Genova told Fox News regarding the Russia investigation that Trump had been framed by the Justice Department and FBI with a falsely created crime. Tonsing has been among the leading voices calling for a second special counsel to investigate whether there was any wrongdoing by the Clinton Foundation surrounding the U.S. government panel's approval of the 2013 sale of a large uranium firm to Russian interests. The senior administration official said the couple also looked disheveled when they came to meet with the president on Thursday, which helped convince Trump they weren't the right fit for the team. Both De Genova and Tonsing did have potential conflicts in the Russia case. Their firm represented Mark Corallo, the former Trump legal team spokesman who was interviewed in February in the Mueller probe. And they represented Sam Clovis, a Trump 2016 campaign official who supervised foreign policy adviser George Papadopoulos, who pleaded guilty in October for lying to the FBI. Corallo told Politico last Monday he had signed a standard waiver clearing his attorneys to represent Trump. Clovis did not respond to a request for comment about his lawyer's potential new client. Trump has denied his legal team is in turmoil. Many lawyers and top law firms want to represent me in the Russia case, don't believe the fake news narrative that it is hard to find a lawyer who wants to take this on. Fame and fortune will never be turned down by a lawyer. Though some are conflicted, Trump wrote in two tweets Sunday from his South Florida retreat. Problem is that a new, lawyer or law firm will take months to get up to speed, if for no other reason than they can bill more, which is unfair to our great country, and I am very happy with my existing team. Besides, there was no collusion with Russia, except by crooked Hillary and the Dems. And now, Trump's personal response on the Russia case is being led by Sekulow a conservative attorney who has served as the team's most prominent public face since joining last June. Behind the scenes, he's been spearheading the president's legal defense research on some of the constitutional questions involved in Mueller's investigation. Four attorneys with ties to Sekulow's nonprofit, the American Center for Law and Justice, have also contributed, Emory Law School senior lecturer Mark Goldfeder, Stuart Roth. A longtime legal partner and a Mercer University Law School classmate, former federal prosecutor and Georgia State Attorney Andrew E. Kahnemu, and ACLJ senior counsel Benjamin Sisney. Informally, 
Trump also continued to speak with his longtime lawyer Mark Kasowitz, a New York-based attorney who originally led the president's Russia response but stepped down last summer. He's also been in contact with Janine Pirro, a Fox News Channel host the president has known for decades. The official White House response has been led by Ty Cobb. The president has told Cobb his job is safe, but he has also been soliciting outside advice on whether a shakeup is needed. Cobb has preached cooperation with Mueller as the best approach for clearing the president from the cloud of investigation, though he's repeatedly been overly optimistic in his attempts to signal when the probe could end. Cobb has not responded to a series of requests for comment over the past week, though he said Thursday night he still worked at the White House. In an interview, former Cobb law partner Robert Bennett last week called for Cobb to resign to preserve his professional reputation. I hope my friend Ty Cobb will leave the team. He's not helping himself or his reputation, said Bennett, a former personal attorney to President Bill Clinton. Trump has been gauging interest for weeks from other prominent attorneys, including former George W. Bush Solicitor General Ted Olson, who recently turned down an offer from Trump by citing conflicts with his law firm. The notion of saying no to represent the President of the United States is kind of amazing, Bennett said. Eliana Johnson contributed to this report. Emotions run high at gun control demonstration. Hundreds of thousands of people from across the country descended on Washington Saturday to demand action on gun control in a mass demonstration that could rival the annual women's marches sparked by President Donald Trump's election. Spurred by the school shooting in Parkland, Florida last month, the March for Our Lives has the backing of well-funded gun control groups like Every Town for Gun Safety. They are organizing youth voter registration drives and running crash courses on activism and public policy. More than 800 sibling marches are planned across the United States and in other countries on Saturday. The demonstration is the culmination of years of inaction by lawmakers as mass shootings have continued unabated in America. Left-leaning activists, feeling stymied by the National Rifle Association's lobbying are wielding one of the few tools they have left, taking to the streets to demand change. The adults haven't been able to make these changes so the kids are going to show us how it's done, Parkland student Alex Wynn said. Emotions ran high during some of the speeches Saturday. Samantha Fuentes, a Parkland student who was shot in both legs, recited a poem she wrote about the assault. I was crying tears and blood at the same time, Fuentes told the crowd. She then paused, doubled over and vomited behind the podium. When she recovered after a few moments, Fuentes straightened up and said proudly, I just threw up on international television and it feels awesome. Shortly after, Emma Gonzalez, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas student who has become one of the most recognizable faces of the youth movement demanding gun control reform, took the stage. Crying Gonzalez read the Parkland victims' names and took a long pause. Pennsylvania Avenue was completely silent, save for the shutter of cameras and distant sirens. Students on stage and in the crowd began chanting, Never again! Gonzalez then paused for 6 minutes and 20 seconds, to represent how long Nicolas Cruz was shooting in the school. This is what democracy looks like. Protesters chanted throughout the rally. Ridership numbers public transportation confirmed a large turnout, though perhaps not as large as the Women's March in January 2017. As of 1 p.m., Washington Metro Rail had given 207,000 rides, officials said, compared to about 230,000 for an entire normal Saturday. The Women's March drew 1 million rides for the whole day, according to news reports at the time the second busiest day ever behind Barack Obama's inauguration in 2009. People began streaming toward Pennsylvania Avenue hours before the march began. Police were everywhere, stationed at metro stations and every few feet along the route. Signs were posted along the route notifying marchers that firearms aren't allowed in the area, even with a license to carry. At 9 a.m., the area in front of the stage, erected near the base of the U.S. Capitol, had already filled up. 
A number of signs knocked the Trump administration's support for training and arming school personnel. This future teacher will never carry a gun, one sign read. My job is to teach, not return fire, another said. The demonstration comes days after a shooting at Great Mills High School in Southern Maryland, which killed two students, one of whom was taken off life support on Thursday. What better place to demand that Congress take action than their home? said Anna Sophie Tenenni, a 17-year-old senior at Penridge High School, 30 miles north of Philadelphia. Tenenni said this week that she and a dozen or more of her peers plan to leave for Washington before dawn on Saturday. Tenenni recently made headlines when she and her classmates received attention for participating in a nationwide school walkout calling for gun control. They protested during detention sitting in a circle on the floor and wearing the names of the Parkland victims on their shirts. The Parkland kids aren't going away, she said. They're inspiring so many kids in Generation Z, the demographic cohort after millennials. Seventeen people, to honor the number of people killed at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, spoke. Several celebrities, like Jennifer Hudson, Ariana Grande, Miley Cyrus, and Demi Lovato, performed. The route for the march stretches down Pennsylvania Avenue, past the Trump International Hotel and stopping short of the White House. The march will be followed by mass school walkouts across the country on April 20. Preparation was in full swing on Thursday and Friday, with D.C. officials erecting barricades, portable toilets and temporary cell phone towers. Temporary cement barriers stood in front of the Trump International Hotel on Friday in addition to two layers of metal barricades. Inside, bartenders nervously chit-chatted with guests about the impending crush of protesters. On Saturday, military trucks blocked off downtown streets nearly the Trump Hotel as demonstrators flooded onto Pennsylvania Avenue. The city's public transportation system was bracing for long lines and crowds. Restaurants offered discounted meals to marchers and the ride-sharing app Lyft offered free rides to the march. Local families have been offering up their homes to students with nowhere to stay. The marches in Washington and across the country will be accompanied by what's expected to be an extensive youth voter registration push. Organizers have been pushing state-specific voter registration toolkits, and the Parkland students have talked up the importance of voting in media appearances. One volunteer said roughly 250 people were working to register new voters at the rally. The Parkland students and teenagers nationwide, many of whom just turn 18 or are about to turn 18, have vowed to remove from office state and federal lawmakers who refuse to act on gun control. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School senior David Hogg, a survivor of the Parkland shooting, said the protesters need to make politicians who oppose gun control pay a price. Who here is voting in the 2018 midterm elections? He said at the rally. Organizers of the marches are pushing a petition that calls on Congress to ban the sale of assault weapons and high-capacity magazines and background checks for the purchases of all guns, a nearly impossible political ask. Congress has only mustered support for modest measures since the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Mass shootings that killed 26 at Sandy Hook Elementary School in 2012 and 58 in Las Vegas last year yielded nothing. A $1.3 trillion government spending bill signed by Trump on Friday includes measures to improve records and information sharing in the FBI's National Instant Criminal Background Check System and federal grants to improve school safety. The White House has also launched a new commission, led by Education Secretary Betsy DeVoe, to consider school safety measures. Trump also tweeted Friday about his administration's move to ban bump stocks the devices that are used to turn semi-automatic weapons into machines guns. We applaud the many courageous young Americans exercising their First Amendment rights today, the White House said in a statement Saturday. Keeping our children safe is a top priority of the president's, which is why, Trump, urged Congress to pass the Fix Nicks and Stop School Violence Acts, and sign them into law. Many adults took to the streets, too saying they were inspired by personal experiences with gun violence. Danny Robb, a 64-year-old retired Air Force colonel, traveled from then 7,000 miles from Okinawa, Japan to Washington. 
On March 24, 1998, 20 years ago today, two gunmen shot up his daughter's middle school in Jonesboro, Arkansas, killing five people. She happened to stay home that day, but a friend she sat next to in class was killed. Now, Rob said he hopes young people will succeed where his generation fell short. In the military, you're taught that to be a good leader you have to be a good follower, Rob said. And the kids need to take the lead on this. Trump very happy with my legal team. President Donald Trump on Sunday morning railed against reports that top legal minds have turned down an opportunity to join his team of lawyers working on the Russia probe, saying no one would turn down the opportunity at fame and fortune. Many lawyers and top law firms want to represent me in the Russia case, don't believe the fake news narrative that it is hard to find a lawyer who wants to take this on, the president wrote on Twitter. Fame and fortune will never be turned down by a lawyer, though some are conflicted. Trump added that the problem is a new, lawyer or law firm will take months to get up to speed, if for no other reason than they can bill more, which is unfair to our great country, and I am very happy with my existing team. Later Sunday, Trump attorney Jay Sekulow said in a statement that the president was reversing course and not hiring Joseph D. Genova and Victoria Tonsing, a husband and wife team whose possible work for the president proved to be controversial. The Washington Post has reported that former Solicitor General Theodore Olson, best known for representing George W. Bush in Bush v. Gore, the landmark fight that determined the winner of the 2000 presidential election, turned down an opportunity to join the president's team. The news came days before John Dowd, the lead lawyer for Trump on special counsel Robert Mueller's probe, resigned. D. Genova, who has been critical of Mueller's investigation, was hired March 19. On Sunday, Trump said once again that there had been no collusion between his campaign and the Russian government. Addressing concerns that $1.6 billion for border security in the just passed Tom and Bus bill is not enough for a border wall with Mexico, the president added simply, it is just a down payment. Work will start immediately.